Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. I um, am just happy to be hosting today in the place of Anissa. She had a family emergency, so she's asked me to host, and I'm very proud uh, to be here with Rick this morning. All right, so we are here today to talk with um, Rick Miller. He's going to talk to us about raising your team's engagement with agile rebranding strategies. I don't know about y'all, but I'm very excited about hearing about this as we, um, as we get back into work. The first thing I want to do, though, is highlight our sponsors. First of all, the David Whitmarsh Consulting Group. Uh, David is a partner of ours for a long time. He's actually the marketing arm for Turnkey. And he has been instrumental in helping us pull up all of these, uh, what have we done now, 50, 60 different webinars, uh, helping us get all of y'all on. Um, we also have been working with a company I'm sure everybody's heard of, Insperity. And they actually are offering, just for your attendance today, a free financial analysis report and debrief. Um, this will help you gain insight into the real cost of burden of being an employer, identify the costs associated over the cycle of your employees, comparing your HR strategy and budget against successful organizations, learn from expert HR analysis, and aligning your HR strategy with best practices. If you're interested in getting that report, just email us at turnkey, or just go to turnkeycoachingsolutions.net HR report. It's a great report. Oh, shoot. And it clicked. So I opened it for you. <laughs> now, uh, the other thing I just wanted to highlight, too, is Turnkey is also doing outplacement services and career transition. We have a number of different packages available. So if any of you on the phone are interested in outplacement, please do let us know because we think we've got some unique offerings uh, for anybody that unfortunately is in that situation, but we're here to help in any way that we can. Uh, as I mentioned, we have had 40s, not enough. I think we've had almost 60 webinars. We're going to be finishing through the end of the month um, so please do let us know if there's any topics you'd like to uh, hear about or in the future that you're interested in about. We're, we're more than happy to do more of these. <clears throat> I am Wendy Carrick. I am the VP of People at Turnkey Consulting. I uh, have prior experience in learning and development in the corporate world, in HR. Uh, my passion really is leadership development at all levels. Uh, I think everybody can be a leader, and um, that's where my, my experience has been and certainly where my passion is, and I love working with Turnkey and all the wonderful people here and helping all of you guys. Let me also introduce Rick. Rick is the president and CEO, uh, has over 30 years of experience working in both the public and the private companies in financial, operational, and administrative roles. Uh, Rick is... And I, like me, we love to talk, we love to share our experience, we love to help people, and we just love to really present um, and help others learn about the things that we've learned over our career. So with that said, I'm going to turn the time over to Rick, and he will um, take you through this wonderful presentation. Okay, well, thank you, Wendy, and I'm going to, um, okay, looks like I got the right screen there so we can carry on from here and I just appreciate this opportunity to hopefully have a conversation today. I'm going to go through some thoughts that I've been uh, uh, sharing and working with some uh, companies over the last few months and uh, hopefully there'll, there'll be some tips to you. But if you're like me and most of the participants here, I'm suffering from a little bit of Zoom fatigue. So I've got an opening exercise I want us to do to get us in the right frame to go through the, this conversation. What I'm going to ask you to do is uh, I want, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and repeat a phrase after me, and then we're going to celebrate. So what I'm going to ask you to do is close your eyes and say, it's going to be a great day. Then I want you to clap your fingers or snap your hand or do something to smile. So first thing, everybody take a deep breath. Now close your eyes and repeat after me. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be a great day. 
Okay. I'm going to explain why we did that as we go through this, but it's just part of what I think will help us understand uh, that we do need to be focusing on having great days. So with that, um, what I want to do is uh, share with you some things, like I said, that we've been, uh, I found have been helping some companies reopen because in where I am in Alabama, we're in the first phase of reopening. And I know some of the people on here may not even be reopened yet. So hopefully, uh, some of these tips will help you get going. You know, and I know in Utah, Rick, we're, um, we're in phase two of reopening and people are still, you know, anxious about it for sure. Yeah. And I think one of the things to, to start with is let's put it back in perspective of where things were at the start of this year. I don't know about you, Wendy, but in January, everybody I was talking to, and including my own business, I was so optimistic. I mean, I saw everything moving forward. I saw clients talking about capital improvements. I saw everybody's uh, teams. You know, I, I actually was having a hard time working because everybody was doing so well that they didn't have time to need a consultant. Um, so with that, welcome to June 2020. And, um, I don't know about you, but what I've seen over this uh, shutdown period is that uh, everybody's taken a hit. That we've gone from that positive, upbeat uh, attitude to where uh, the owners I know feel like they're uncertain. The employees and friends that I have have really uh, been fighting between a little bit of uncertainty, a little fear, uh, a little depression. I think we all have. And I think we all have wondered about where our customers are going to be because some of our customers may not be there uh, when we fully reopen. And so I think that's, that's the reality that we've been living in. Now, yeah. here uh, and I agree, Rick. I mean, I've seen all of my clients um, and of Turnkey's clients too. We've had a few that have backed off and have just really been leery about moving forward with anything. Um, we've had a few, and I've had a couple clients myself that have um, continued virtually, but boy, not letting us in. <laughs> They're not, I was told we can't have visitors the other day. So I think, I think we're in for a little bit of a, a long haul to get us all back together. And, you know, most of my uh, executives or, or owners I work with, even though they've, they, some of them have had a quick honeymoon when we reopened this month, most of them are still very uh, tight with their cash. They're not sure what they're going to do, how many employees they're going to need, or how they're going to structure things. And that's what we're going to talk about. Here's the part that's really uh, getting to me is that the experts that we used to rely on don't know anything any more than we do. No. Mm -mm. This, this is just a chart I pulled together from, I get a monthly newsletter from Wells Fargo. For the last 20 years, they showed their you know, a bunch of metrics, uh, unemployment, gross national product. This is one on expected unemployment by quarter nationally. And you can see January and February, you know, an organization the size of Wells knows what they're doing, just like in Sparity, everything's perfect. And then look at March and then look at April. In a two month period, you can see the swings that, you know, unfortunately they don't know what's going on any more than we do. And last week's jobs report just shows that we're still in this incredible uh, uncertainty. You know, is it a V-shaped recovery, U-shaped, round-shaped? I don't know. Yeah, I don't think anybody knows, just like yeah. you said. Mm -hmm. So here's the one thing that I do know that I think uh, those of us in the HR uh, section know, and that is, in January, like I was saying, most of us, when I looked at our companies, whether you looked at Lencioni's model or Maslow's, our employee base was pretty high. Our team was working pretty well. Could be better, but it was in pretty good shape. But from talking to folks now, I think we'd all be kidding ourselves if we didn't admit that all of us and our employees as well have taken an emotional hit. I mean, you know, when you're used to doing things and you throw all of your routines and your habits out the door, and then there's uncertainty as to whether or not, when, or what you'll be coming back to, psychologically, I think we're in a much tougher place. I know personally, I am. And I would agree. I, I, even though I think 
you know, most of us, especially in the coaching world and in the leadership development world, tend to um, think in the positive and that things, you know, they'll just kind of go back and everything will be okay. It really isn't. It impacts you. It impacts certainly my psychological well-being, just really not knowing, um, you know, where things are going to end up, what, what we're going to be doing in the end, how it's going to work in the end. Um, that, that, and then, you know, really depending upon our leaders and how they lead us through this, um, if we, you know, are employed by someone else, the trust or the conflict or the safety all come into play, for yeah, sure. And even, even the good leaders that I've been coaching and working with, they'll even admit to me, you know, I can't believe that I'm forgetting to do things. You know, right. they, they said we're habits for 10 years and now they're finding themselves, I can't believe I didn't do that. So that just tells me that everybody's... Uh, somewhere on this chart, they've slid down. And, and, and here's the thing. What we're going to talk about today is that most of the folks I've talked to naturally, they're focusing in on their customers. You know, what, uh, what do I need to do to get restarted? Where are my customers? Do I need to change what I'm doing? Because maybe their reality is a little bit different too. And so you're naturally focused on that. Because, you know, without customers, you don't need a revenue. Right. You know, but I think the most important part of that, because most of the people I've been working with are trying to figure out how to redo their business model, you know, how to reconstruct what they're doing. And I think in the process of doing that, it's very easy to not realize that um, your business model only works as well as your team's ability to execute it. And I know that because um, I'm a bass player in a band. And you never hear the bass player unless the bass player is messing up. But you know when a song doesn't have a good rhythm section. And I think we're so focused on, you know, uh, the lead that we're forgetting about the rhythm section, which is our employee base. I agree. And, you know, we forget our employee base in a normal environment, <laughs> Rick. So, um really trying to focus on them. I mean, I totally understand. And we at Turnkey have certainly been trying to focus on our customers and, and building programs to fit their, what we think are their needs now. But um, taking care of your team and make sure, making sure that they are good to go um, and that they have a place to voice their concerns and um, you're there to listen is really important and continue to build that trust uh, with your employees is, is most critical. And, and well said, and, and you know, it's, it's more difficult now that you're trying to put together things with your employees using Zoom, you know, or go to meeting. It's just a different environment versus walking down the hall and saying, okay, let's meet in the conference room. So I think it's a trickier environment, but I still think that that's the reason why we're having this a conversation today because I, I think if we don't, uh, we may be in for a uh, some hiccups in the rest of the year. Right. Let me just show you what I've been sharing based on kind of the things that the tools that I have in my toolbox and that the, the uh, feedback I've been getting is, yeah, that makes sense. And what I've tried to focus on is what I'm terming reboarding because you know, we all know that onboarding is still a challenge in general, but I think with our existing employees, we need to have that same mindset and what I'm calling reboarding. And what I've found in this new world is that I've, I've combined a couple of different tools that I've worked with uh, for a long period of time and one that I've recently added. And I found just like a, uh, a prescription, you know, a doctor prescribing different drugs, trying to figure out what'll make the patient better. I think in combination, these have been useful that I'm hearing, yeah, this is helping. Um, and so I'm gonna go through uh, strength assessments, uh, Gallup's Q12 employee engagement tools, and then uh, Dr. BJ Fogg's behavioral model that he calls tiny habits. And I put that quote down there because I think that third piece is just a little extra that may help you get your, your team moving in the direction you need them to move in. I like that quote. People change best by feeling good, not by feeling bad. Yeah, when you feel bad, you just really don't 
you don't move. <laughs> so, well, and and we know, you know, for those of on the call that study brain behavior that when you feel good, you release dopamine. And that's what we're going to talk about. And dopamine is the chemical that helps you develop positive or negative habits, but it's dopamine that, that gets you wanting more. So, you know, let me go through these three models and then show you what, you know, how we can use them together or how I have. Uh, Don Clifton's the father of, of strength-based psychology. Um, out of Nebraska, and he actually bought and is CEO, was CEO of the Gallup organization. What he determined is when you focus on people's strengths, as I'm sure everybody on this conversation knows, that you, when an organization focuses on it, it has great financial and uh, metric you know, implications. And so what he's been doing is putting together uh, his strength-based assessment for the last 20 years. And I've been using it with all my clients because I've always found that when you put people in their strength zone, they're easier to manage. And more importantly, in this environment, they're more agile because when you're doing what you're good at, it's easy to adjust and move. Here's the best part of it to me is that these assessments are $20 each. And so I work with mostly small companies and I'm sure the volume discounts on it, but right now, if there ever was a time to make sure that you're re that as you redo what we're going to be doing as our new business model or strategy, you need to look at your employee base, in my opinion, to make sure that you're going to match their strengths with your new job or uh, requirements to execute your strategy. You know, I, I happen to buy into the Clifton Strengths Assessment um, as well. I think it's a great tool. You're right, it's very inexpensive and it's easy to understand. Um, and definitely believe and certainly know for myself um, that if I'm not working within my strengths, I'm not as happy as I would be. That doesn't mean I can't do other things that are not maybe 100% of my strengths. But if I can focus and really be engaged in something that I'm good at, like yakking, talking, <laughs> then I'll be much happier during the day than if I have to say, write, uh, you know, a proposal or do something in Excel that I'm just not really crazy about. Or mainly if there aren't people around, I really struggle. I really, really struggle. So I always am looking for places where I can use my strengths because it just makes my day better. Yeah, and, and, and like you said, because there aren't people around as much as there used to be. Mm -hmm. And for a high eye, we need to make sure that we're aware of that so that we design whatever tasks are going to be uh, need to be done going forward. We need to think through that and make sure we try to align that as best we can. Agreed. And then any of you that know anything about Gallup's Q12, they've been, to me, they're the holy grail. Uh, I studied them and found out that as a financial person, until I started focusing on the people issues, then all my Excel spreadsheets weren't worth much. So that led me to go to their high performance uh, training and I got uh, certified in that. What I have found is that their 20 million surveys are pretty well uh, spot on. Mm -hmm. And 12 questions that they've been unable to get rid of because they show that they have positive correlation between high and low performing uh, people in these questions and things like profitability, turnover, customer engagement. So of the 12, I'm gonna show you three that I wanna focus on that we can talk about that I think will help you right now. Their first question is, I know what's expected of me at work. Well, as we've been talking about, I don't think most people are as clear about that as they were in January. I agree. You know, their third question is, and this is one where I'm always working with companies to improve, and that is, at work, I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day. That ties back to that strength uh, assessment and how do you do that. And this fourth one is my goal mine. I can work with any company and guarantee that they need help in this area because uh, what it says is in the last seven days, I have received recognition for praise of doing good work. What I call that is a write-up, R-I-G-H-T, yep. not a W-R-I-T-E. Yep. Most of these cultures that I've encountered still like the, the W 
one and I'm trying to teach them the R one. And I think right now, in light of the way that we all agree everybody's psychologically less stable than they were, they definitely need this. And so those are the three that I want to concentrate on with the strengths. There's others, but those really, I think right now, uh, I found that when you, as I'll show you, they're pretty helpful. Yeah, and I, I agree. I've um, been familiar and have actually used that Q12 before in a, in a prior organization. And I, I was there probably seven years. And then we implemented uh, the Q12 and the employee engagement and the performance and bottom line revenue increased over the next seven years that I was there just insurmountably. It was quite interesting to me to see that because we took action on the results from the, the Q12 and we ran it every year and we communicated every year about how, how much better things were, they just got better and better. And the last thing I'll just say too, in recognizing people, I know some of us feel like, oh, I don't need that recognition every day. I think you do. I really think you need to be in a positive environment. You need to um, have the experience of doing well. And I had an experience yet just in March, just right before the pandemic hit, of um, presenting to a group of professionals like myself. So I was a bit nervous, um, but not one person, I didn't get one negative comment. People were picking out when you did well here, you did well there. I'd never really been in that kind of environment before. And so it was just very uplifting to me to have people say I did a good job. You know, it was, it was really remarkable. You know, and it just employee engagement to me, you know, being a, a mediocre bass player in, in some bands, to me, employee engagement's the rhythm section that, you, it, you know, in a song, you rarely hear the bass. You don't know it's there, but yet if it's not right and it's not in sync, the band knows it and something's not right. The song doesn't sound right. You know, yeah. if the rhythm section isn't tight. And employee engagement is all about keeping that kind of below the surface uh, rhythm section tight. Mm -hmm. And I think where, where when, when I started playing the bass, it hit me that that was what I was doing in, in terms of uh, using those tools. This last tool is one that I recently discovered that to me was kind of one of those missing pieces in my consulting that's been useful. And I didn't, didn't plan on using it the way the pandemic has allowed me to use it, but it's one of those kind of serendipities you run into. BJ Fogg started the, the Stanford uh, Behavior Lab in the late 80s and 90s, and he's very well known for his use of digital persuasion. Uh, his students coming out of his class at Stanford started Instagram. And what his digital persuasion is, is that when you make it easy for people to do what they want to do, uh, they become, they do it more. They develop a habit. So think about the like button on Facebook. Now, what he's done over the last 10 years is really focus more on people and behavior. And this model that, he, that he's developed says that behavior is a function of when motivation and ability have a prompt. And really, it sounds simple, but what you find is right now, motivation can go up and down and ability, those are the trade-offs. And that action line says that depending on where you are on those two will determine whether or not you take action. For me, what I wanna show you is um, we need to be thinking about as we move our employees forward and get them realigned, how do we make it easy for them to do what we need them to do if we're changing our business model or we're changing where they work and how they work. And so this little piece to me is a catalyst to help you change. And it's used uh, with companies as well as with uh, individuals. So this was my missing piece. And what I wanna do is the way he does that, just to, I won't spend any time here, because you can, I can show you how to, to learn more about it, but any hate behavior you have, what he says is you can change and add a new behavior, Wendy, if you anchor it to something you're already doing, and then you add a new tiny behavior that's easy to do, that you know you can do, and then you celebrate. So it was pretty easy to close your eyes and to say, I'm gonna have a great day 
and then celebrate. That's an example of a tiny habit. So, you know, I love that actually, and I've been practicing that. I didn't know this is where it came from, but someone, I think it was Anissa, actually told me about just adding one more thing to what you do. So for example, every morning I get up and I have a cup of tea and I know I'm not drinking enough water. So in my habits, before I have my tea as I'm brewing it, I have a whole glass, eight ounce glass of water. <laughs> then I have my tea and then I have another water. So I'm really trying to just add water into my tea habit. Um, and I think it certainly has, it's certainly helping. And, and again, going back to that quote, people change best by feeling good. Mm -hmm period of change. And so what I see is we need to make it as easy as possible for those changes that are going to come out of the pandemic and are restarting our companies and our teams. So let me walk you through how those three, how I've combined them, where when I've talked to companies and said, think about this and go, yeah, that makes sense. So let's start with those first two questions you know, that uh, Gallup's Q12, I know what's expected of me at work and every day I get to do something that I enjoy doing. Well, if you think about it, a lot of people right now have had job-based tasks and they may or may not be good at them, but they may be changing. And you may be asking them, well, we now need to do it this way, change our distribution or our marketing or something. And my suggestion is if that's where you were before and you're asking people to do something that because it's new, it may be hard for them to grasp. What if you made sure that you looked at their strengths first? And when you look at what needs to be done in your new business model, you actually try to align the uh, strengths of your employees with the new task as opposed to just adding it to the existing job description. And I think when you move people into their strength zone, if you're asking them to be agile, which to me agile means, I know that's what I said we're gonna do yesterday, but today I just found out we need to do this. That requires agility of the team to be willing to go through those type of changes, which I think we're gonna have for the next few months. Mm -hmm. And the other one is, and this is really more for uh, the weekly feedback. And this is for the managers, for the supervisors of the world that most of them that I've worked with, they fully agree with me, Wendy. They say, yep. And then it takes me three months to get them to do it consistently because it's just so, it's not natural. But what would happen to your employees if you made it an intentional goal and you actually implemented giving them feedback once a week on what they did well. I think you're going to move their motivation up. And so when I've kind of suggested this to companies, they've seen the benefit of kind of combining those different tools in a way that's going to help them reactivate their team. You know, I know I've experienced that um, just personally, again, back to the presentation that I gave, the feedback, even though I knew there were things I could do differently and I could have done better, uh, the feedback that people gave was pointed, um, it was specific, and left me feeling like, oh, I can do that again. And so next time I'm invited to do that, I will be much better just based on the feedback given directly after, after that presentation. We all do. None of us get enough positive feedback in this world. And you know, it's one of those things that if it were easy, everybody would do it. But yet the companies that intentionally decide they're gonna do it, um, just like you gave an example, it works. Mm -hmm. And we need to do it with our kids. We need to do it with our employees. We need to do it with everybody. So. Mm -hmm. um, I find that that's one that I'm, I'm, I'm still having to work on and I try to teach people how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not, it's not top of mind, especially when you are in a you know, crisis mode, if you will, or you're trying to get your new product launched or whatever the task is at hand, that job-based task is that you're focused on. It's really hard as a leader to stop and say, you know what, when you did this, no matter how small it is, when you did this, it really had this impact on me, and thank you. Uh, what a what a difference that makes in your day. You know, the, the, on both the, sides. 
the executives I coach, the first question I have when I meet with them, some of them weekly, is who'd you praise this week? Yeah, good question. And, and how did you praise them? But mm -hmm. that's, that again, these kind of combine for me that I found, um, hopefully with somebody on this call says, yeah, may, maybe that'll help. I don't want to spend a lot of time on these, but I just wanted to show you these that whenever Dr. Fogg, who's been working with a lot of big companies out in Silicon Valley as well. And what I found is every time he goes into work with a team, and I'm saying a group of 50 or more, he will start them the first week. Their two tiny habits are these. That first one he calls the Maui habit because he invented it while he was uh, at his house in Maui. And so it's after my feet hit the floor, which everybody's going to do when they get out of bed. We did what we said, and then you celebrate. And the other one is, he says, I have every team start with, after I step into the shower, I think of one thing I'm grateful for, and I do some celebration. And again, uh, just an example, there's plenty more, but I just wanted to show you that. Here's some examples that are how you can do that to, to give positive uh, feedback to somebody every week. You know, and again, start, don't try to say, I'm going to do it. He would say, just write down somebody's name today that you want to do it this week. Just make it as tiny as half, as small as possible to make sure that you're get you're feeling good about your intentions of I'm moving forward, trying to do what I know I, I should do. So I really like that. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to implement that. After I finish the day, I'll write down one thing I did well. I don't know about y'all, but some days I just feel like I didn't accomplish everything. I mean, most days, I'll be honest. Most days I feel like I didn't accomplish the things I needed to do. And I, so I, I tend to focus on, oh my gosh, I'm not doing the things I need to do. And I'm not celebrating because I don't feel like celebrating. So if I switch that in my brain to say, I'm just every end of the day, I'm gonna write one thing that I did well. Um, and do some kind of celebration, you know, with my arms and say, well, I did one thing well <laughs> today. I think that'll make a difference. So I'm going to try yeah. that. Wendy, the one thing about it, you're, you're typical. We all are. And, and, and one of the things that I've learned to this process is that celebration that I mentioned earlier is critical. Mm -hmm. Because celebrate doing something, it, it triggers that dopamine. And that's kind of digging the channel in your brain that's going to set up that that channel that, that is really the deeper the channel, the more likely it is that you'll continue doing it. And that's how you build chemically. That's how you build a, a, a habit. Just to show you that um, Dr. Fogg is OCD. This is a sheet of a hundred ways to celebrate. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's awesome. I know. I said, you, you know, I won't go into what I thought when I saw that list, but what I found is, all of us need to do that, and it's for a chemical reason, not some psychobabble reason. So I just wanted to make sure people think that I'm just not into the celebrating, but it does work. So it does make a difference. I think it does too, because it gets you out of the funk. It gets, you know. So Sheila yeah. says, acknowledgement, praise, communication is the cornerstone of a positive work, work culture. And working with Sheila, I know she believes that 100%. Um, and some days it's one foot forward, two steps back, and we forget about what we actually accomplished. So Sheila can be my partner in writing down what we accomplished during a day. And Sheila, your list is long. So I know <laughs> that you'll have a lot to celebrate. Same with you, Paige. Yeah, and it, it just takes some time and having an accountability partner certainly helps. Mm -hmm. So that's what I wanted to share. And I guess what I've, I've learned is that when you try to um, intentionally focus on reboarding your employees that um, you're going to learn some things that in the process you'll be able to withstand the next wave of change, whether it's a pandemic or some other change, some disruptive technology hits your business or whatever. And I love this, this picture just because I'm a, an old surfer and I look at that and think, you know, if that's my employee, that is the most engaged employee I could ever hope for because I know this, this person's loving what they're doing. They're totally focused. They're oblivious to any distraction and they're going for what they want to go for. I like that picture too. Yeah, so, um, have, you, have you been in a tunnel like that in your surfboard? Yes, but it was like 50 years ago. <laughs> 
put it this way, we don't have very many waves like that on the, the Gulf Coast, but it was after a hurricane and I actually got covered like that. And I honestly said, okay, there must be a God. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, God could only God could create something this perfect. Now, yeah. have I not been in those things more times than not? Absolutely. But when I saw this picture, uh, it captured me. Yeah, it so. certainly makes you want to celebrate because that is a lifetime, one in a lifetime. Well, probably one in a lifetime for many of us, or none in a lifetime for many of us. So glad you experienced that, Rick. That's awesome. Yeah, and I, I just I, I'll turn it. Let me turn it back to you, but I just put this up there so that um, if anybody would like a copy of this presentation to go back through it, and uh, if they email me, I can show them how they can sign up for a free five-day kind of introduction to those tiny habits to help them learn a little bit in depth, uh, and it's a free course that they can do 10 minutes a day. So, uh, okay, if, great. Great. Thanks so much, Rick. I, I certainly gleaned a lot from that today. And I know Sheila has. She said, such a wonderful idea. End each day with celebration. And we're going to take that to heart. Um, so we're, we're two of us, three of us, Paige included. Um, I haven't heard from any of the other participants on the line. So I want to open that up. We've got a couple of minutes. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts they would like to uh, ask? Feel free to put those in the chat. And Rick, Rick yeah. will be happy to, to answer. I'm just looking in there. All right. Well, I know everybody's busy. So if there are no questions, let me share my screen. I'll just end with a couple of things. Um, let me get through this real quick. Great presentation, Rick. I took a lot of things away. I'm very excited. Um, and it will be, and you're, you're posting it, you know, I know on the, uh, the, the, uh, website as well. So if anybody wants to come back and go through this, it's there too, I know. Yeah. Um, and Sheila has a question, Rick, just quick, quickly, except for your own experience, where do you draw your knowledge from? Um, what books, websites, blogs, potentially could you recommend? Well, um, thank you, Sheila. Most of my knowledge has been through reading. You know, I've, I went through a lot of Gallup work. Uh, BJ Fogg has Tiny Habits. I've read a lot. Um, there's, there's somebody else I ran into named uh, Jody Thompson. She runs Culture RX and is the creator of the uh, results oriented work environment. So 10 years ago, she was preaching it's okay to let employees work from home and manage their own schedule. And I think she's influenced me a lot in this area, you know, pre pandemic. Um, but I'm I read any and everything. I'm Patrick Lencioni, uh, Traction. I, let's put it this way. I, am, I absorb more information than I can remember. But what I find is that uh, not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. And once that statement kind of sunk into me, I just find that there's always a great podcast out there. There's always somebody I can be listening to that's better than you know just listening to music. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. My daughter does that. It's interesting you say that. I've got a couple of daughters. One I don't think reads at all and the other one reads a lot. And you can certainly see the difference in their leadership ability, quite frankly. It's, it, it's a very interesting dynamic for sure. Yeah. And uh, Maria or Marcio asked a question about how about working with negative people, those kind that the black girls are over there, always over their head. How do you do that, Rick? Not very well some days, I guess is the best answer. What I have found is um, you don't have to take the bait because usually, you know, that statement, hurting people hurt others. Usually when somebody's negative, they've got an experience that we don't understand. And if you're willing to just uh, stay positive and ask, keep asking them questions as to why they feel that way, you're showing them a respect that they're not used to because they're looking for an argument. And if you just keep asking them questions about why, that, why this or that's interesting, can you tell me more? It tends to soften that, that negative edge that they kind of uh, lead with, if you will. Good, thank you for that. And it's not easy. I'm, I'm with you on that. Sometimes okay. it's hard to crack through the negativity, but, you know, being the example and being positive and drawing out 
uh, one tip I might offer is just trying to draw out something that that negative person did that was positive. Maybe that might help change their frame of mind as, as well. One other thing, the tiny habits that I got certified in, we, we talked about that. And one of the tiny habits that I haven't developed that somebody did that had a negative spouse is when that negative spouse would start their negative attack or whatever, they would go, I'm going to turn, I'm going to smile and say, thank you for, for me, for teaching me patience. And that's it. And then they could get into the argument. But what they found is as they did that, it softened the ability and, and the spouse actually realized that they weren't arguing back and, and became less negative. Oh, interesting. I'm going to try that today. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sounds like you're working at home. Yeah, I am actually. That's too funny. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, you guys, thank you so much. Again, here's Rick's information for you guys to copy down if you need that. Also, just want to again highlight our, tr our career transition outplacement services. Uh, if you need help, uh, we do everything from resume writing to interviewing to um, uh, career development, uh, which is a little bit different than finding your next job, um, but we're more than happy to, to help there. And then finally, here's our contact information as well. Um, and I know Paige put in the chat that we will be putting this uh, webinar up within the next 42 hours. So you can certainly pass it along. Feel free to use it again. And she's also included in our chat the link to all of the other wonderful presentations that we've had the pleasure of hosting uh, through this tough time for all of us. So thank you guys. Thank you so much, Rick, for your expertise. Um, I certainly learned some things. I'm adding one more tiny habit to my water and I am certainly going to try that positive, um, positive reinforcement on my negative folks. So thank you very much. My pleasure and thank you Turnkey for this opportunity. This was fun. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye. Okay. I think I'm gone. Awesome. Thanks, Rick. See ya.